in some ways, uh, this session is a little bit where the rubber hits the road in terms of uh, Indian um, naval strategy in the Indian Ocean in response to um, perceptions or, or to a significant extent in response to perceptions about uh, what China is doing in the region. And we have two great speakers, uh, Abhijit Singh, who's a senior fellow with the Observer Research uh, Foundation, former uh, Indian Naval Officer, and Dashana Barua, who's now with uh, Carnegie India. And uh, Abhijit will be uh, talking about how developments or Indian perceptions about how uh, recent developments in the South China Sea uh, impact uh, India's uh, security thinking uh, about the Indian Ocean and potential Indian responses. And uh, Dashana will be talking, uh, focusing on uh, India's uh, thinking about maritime domain awareness and the need to develop a uh, more uh, comprehensive maritime domain awareness system in the Indian Ocean, obviously, uh, at least in part in context uh, of whatever is happening uh, with, with China. So if I could ask um, Abhijit Singh. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, David. Thank you for inviting me. It's a real uh, pleasure and a singular honor for me to be here speaking to all of you. Uh, the trouble with speaking in the last session is all that you wanted to say has already been said. <laughs> but the uh, advantage of speaking in the last session is that you go back with a light conscience because if the audience hasn't understood something, it's not your fault. Yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> I've been asked to speak uh, on India's maritime strategy uh, in response to China's uh, strategy in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, but what I'll do is that before I get there, I'll make a set of four specific observations, and some followed by some general remarks. I think it's important for me to make these four observations because with my experience of having served in the Navy, there might be a certain perspective that I might bring to bear on some of the discussions that have, that have happened since morning that have tend to discuss a few issues. And I, might feel, and I do feel that on certain operational issues, uh, Indian maritime thinkers might think just a little differently. So uh, here's, here's my first point. Now the India-China maritime dynamic is complex. But it's complex not just for the policy maker and the practitioner. It's also complex for the uh, for the analyst, for the for the uh, for the person that's, that's that's studying the issues, and for people that are talking to each other on these issues. Uh, an incident that comes to mind is that just two years back, we had a delegation from China visit the IDSA. I was then a part of the Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis. Uh, this was a very very official sort of delegation. It had. Uh, uh, analysts from the Fudan University, there were some from the Academy of Military Sciences, there were some from the uh, Social Sciences, it was like a mixed. Uh, but we thought this was a very good opportunity to speak to them about, uh, about the issues that were bugging us. And it was very interesting that uh, um, they wanted to talk to us about the OBOR, that is the one, one belt, one road. And we didn't want to hear anything about the OBOR because uh, the OBOR to us was just so vague. It was about gateways and some, you know, core cities and some win-win. And all of that didn't make any sense to us. So we told them, we said that we had enough of this drivel. It, it makes no sense to us. We were honest with them. Please tell us, what do you think about, uh, w w what is your view about China's maritime strategy in the Indian Ocean region? And they said, that doesn't make any sense to us. We never heard about such a thing earlier. We don't think the Chinese have a maritime strategy in the Indian Ocean, in the Indian Ocean region, which actually goes to the crux of the problem, which is the inability of the two sides to empathize with each other's strategic concerns. The Indians, I sensed at that time, I was not, of course not heading the delegation, the Indians were too anxious to know about what the Chinese would do once they would set a permanent base in the Indian Ocean region. We didn't care very much about whether they had an economic strategy, they had a problem with, you know, the one road, when, one belt, one road, uh, Xi, Jinping, this is Xi Jinping's pet project. Their anxiety was that uh, the, mm, the, 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 the OPOR must succeed at all costs and that we must in some ways uh, convince India to join the project. Uh, and that lack of uh, college strategic empathy or communication was really what 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 broke down the uh, uh, the talks at that point because we couldn't we couldn't move beyond a certain uh, a certain point. The second point that I wish to make is that as maritime analysts, it might it might seem a bit odd for a former naval officer to say this. It is it is uh, it is it is very clear that we 
as maritime analysts, we tend to play up the maritime dimension of things, the, the maritime operations dimension of things, the, the, the rivalry between the two sides. I think this is, this is really a, a conflict of geopolitics. It is, it is, it is a conflict of, of vectors and, and counter vectors. So if you have the OBOR, which is a, really a geopolitical project, you have India, on the other, other hand, you have India's uh, uh, look east or act east policy, which is equally geopolitical in character. And if, uh, if, if the Chinese come up with a maritime silk route, well, we have a spice route, we have Mossam. So it is, it is a, a contest of proposals and counter proposals to, uh, to have the balance of narrative in one side's favor. So you try and socialize the region, you try and gain more friends, you try and gain more influence. This is really a contest of influence. And, and what's happening is that when we uh, try and uh, play up the maritime dimension of things, we create further anxieties where none should exist. Now, uh, I will uh, tell you about um, uh, an interesting conversation that I had with uh, Admiral um, Suresh Mehta, who used to be the uh, chief of uh, the naval staff a couple of years back. And uh, after he retired, he took over as the, uh, as the chairman of the National Maritime Foundation, where I was a research fellow. We were having a discussion with some of the Chinese friends. And I, I asked him, I said, sir, isn't it true that uh, we treat the Indian Ocean exactly the same way as the Chinese treat the South China Sea, which is a backyard, uh, an Indian lake? And he said, no, my dear friend, there's a big difference. For the Chinese, the South China Sea is a, is a core interest. It is non-negotiable and that it is something that they will dominate at all costs. For us, uh, that is not quite the case. So he, he, what he was trying to say is this, and this, I'm, I'm just quoting a very interesting thing he said. He said, you see, the China is like the, is the, is like the big, big bully on the block. It has to dominate the region. We are more like the secretary of a housing society. We have no special, right, uh, no special privileges, no special rights, uh, but we have a responsibility to, to, to protect the region. And we have a certain power that comes with being the secretary of a housing society. So you've got to look at it in this way that none of the ind indigenous powers in this part of the world will accept India having a special right over the Indian Ocean region. But in the South China Sea, the, the Chinese, are claiming to have some such special right, which which is, this is a narrative that we've got to put out to say that. So in the morning when it was being discussed, and, and this is where I might have a slight difference of opinion, India does not actually look at the Indian Ocean region as a proprietary zone. It's, as a, it, does, it doesn't think it has a proprietary right over the Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean is an ocean, South China Sea is a small, just a small part of the sea. Uh, but the Chinese uh, are extremely protective about their stakes in the, uh, in, in that region, and that is something that we have to take into account when we are uh, uh, making our uh, uh, mar maritime strategy. Uh, my last uh, observation is, is this: um, you know what the what the Chinese strategy, or rather the OBOR, which at this moment exemplifies uh, the Chinese uh, uh, maritime pitch towards the Indian Ocean, has done very effectively. That it has sowed confusion in the minds of Indian analysts. Uh, earlier, uh, there was almost a broad agreement that this was not good for India. Uh, at least the maritime silk route was not good for India. Because this meant that China was expanding its footprint into the Indian Ocean region. Now, if there is you know, an Admiral Raja Menon who will talk about Chinese strategy in the Indian Ocean region, there will be another analyst like Avijay Sakuja who's, who says that it's good for India to join up with the MSR, take advantage of Chinese proposals. So the Chinese pitch to come in with a great amount of uh, economic uh, um, offerings has in some ways uh, played on the minds of Indian analysts. And now there's, there's much confusion within the Indian uh, um, academia about how exactly should we tackle this problem, which actually plays to China's interests. Because the government and its policy now, I mean, Pramit, Pramit pa uh, Paul mentioned this in the morning, is doing nothing, not because it doesn't want to do nothing, but because it's confused. It doesn't know which, whether doing something is a good thing or doing nothing is a good thing. So, uh, so that confusion, I think, in the long run might play out uh, in, uh, to the advantage um, of, of the Chinese. Now, uh, uh, having said that, let me just make a, a few uh, points about, uh, about the India-China relationship at sea, and, and particularly the naval relationship at sea and, and how that plays out. I think there's four parts of the story here. One is the question of whether India sh shares a 
relationship with China or not. And the, and, and the point to be made there is that, really speaking, that relationship is non-existent. We do uh, cooperate with each other on tactical issues, piracy, uh, search and rescue, other such issues. But really speaking, there's no broader narrative. It's not as if there's a strategic convergence of interests. We don't even have a dialogue to that effect. So, uh, which means that uh, we are discussing um, the, prob the immediate problems that the region faces. But when it comes to discussing the big anxieties that we have about each other's presence in our perceived zones of influence, there seems to be a uh, be a breakdown. Uh, the second is uh, India's perception of of China's interests in the Indian Ocean region. And it is very interesting that the start point of these discussions for most Indian analysts is Chinese submarines in the, in, uh, in the South Asian littorals. It's very interesting that in the past, uh, just in the past three years, there have been close to six uh, Chinese deployments, six de deployments that we know of, of which two have been nuclear submarine deployments. And the Indians will always point out to you that a lot of these submarines that came and spent more time in the Indian Ocean littorals than they did in the waters of Salala, where they were actually supposed to be doing the anti-piracy event. Now, uh, uh, it's not as if the Chinese are not entitled to send, the, send submarines. They can obviously send submarines. But what's a submarine doing in anti-piracy operations? Uh, submarines have nothing to do with piracy. It's not so much the brazenness of the claim that they said, but that it's, it's a deliberate absurdity. Almost as if to say that we will send it to, you know, to shoot uh, the birds <laughs> for all you care. I mean, we are a big power. We can do anything. So, I, so, so the Indians perceive this to be a slight to say that we are sending in submarines when submarines are coming in for anti-piracy. Now, none of these submarines that come into the Indian Ocean region, mo most often, uh, are uh, 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 these deployments are not talked about publicly. So the first time the Chinese sent a nuclear submarine in 2013 to the Indian Ocean region, that was well publicized. There was a whole article in the Wall Street Journal. The Indian Attache and the others were told about it, that the Chinese are going to be sending it. But that was almost a statement that China was making, that we are now going to venture into the Indian Ocean region. But since then, there, have been, there, has, there has been no deployment that India has been really kept in the loop about or told about, which, India, which Indians do find a bit, a bit offensive. But the Indians also say that, look at their, uh, their mode of operations. It's, it's literal. Their, their, their submarines come very close to uh, the, uh, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. These submarines are birthed in, in Karachi, Colombo. They spend a lot of time trying to familiarize themselves with the environment of the Indian Ocean region. There are these amphibious ships these days, the Cheng Bai Shan class, which is Type 71. It's a huge 20,000 ton ship, which, which also does a lot of expeditionary operations. That now comes with the anti-piracy uh, uh, deployments, which means that the Chinese are trying to, trying to understand the littoral environment of the Indian Ocean region. And also we have now these Chinese frigates that come in, these guided missile frigates, uh, and they all have land attack missiles. So, so the, so the so the types of deployments also point to uh, the fact that China is getting more interested in the Indian Ocean region as a theater of regular operations, which is, which is, which is worrying for, for India. But Indian man analysts will also point out three other things that you might find interesting. One is just the, 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 the manner in which the, the Chinese do the uh, uh, maritime diplomacy. So a lot of these ships that come here uh, uh, under the guise of anti-piracy operations end up spending a lot more time in the region, they visit these places, they are doing exercises with Tanzania, you know, African countries, Tanzania, Kenya, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Iran. Uh, they're, trying to, uh, they're trying to gain more friends, become more popular, have more influence. So the whole diplomacy dimension of uh, China's maritime deployments cannot be, cannot be ignored. That is, uh, that's point number one. Second is the, uh, the Chinese uh, understanding of maritime operations other than war, M-O-O-T-W. Uh, the, the Chinese like to treat MOTW as a mission that runs parallel to combat. So they have separate task forces, they have a separate command and control system. They treat MOTW as a tool of foreign policy. So uh, for India, rescuing some of uh, some you know Indians from from a foreign land is just part of the game that 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 navies are supposed to do. Uh, it's just just one of your tasks that you're supposed to do. For the Chinese, it's, it, is, it is a primary task because it, it also showcases your presence and your influence in a region. So just the way the, the, the Chinese treat MOTW is also, is also very unique. Uh, and thirdly, and importantly, is maritime bases. Now, you know, this whole talk about China coming and making bases in the Indian Ocean region might be a, 
uh, might be misplaced because we are not in a world where uh, nations need bases. But the Chinese definitely have these places these days in the, in the Indian Ocean region. These are dual use places that are essentially commercial facilities as Indian maritime analysts will point out, but that can quickly be upgraded to military, low level military facilities uh, that come in very handy in during peacetime operations and peacetime power projection. So uh, uh, conflict is one thing, and we are very, very, very clear that for the next at least about a decade or so, there's no conflict that, that is going to happen. But power projection is quite another. You can have a low level maritime place, and from there you can project power. And so the, the Chinese intentions, uh, um, now that they have Djibouti with them, and there is, a, uh, there is a very clear sign that the Chinese might go and get, try and acquire more places within the Indian Ocean region, whether it be, you know, Gwadar or, uh, or Colombo, Hamantota, uh, Seychelles, Maldives, wherever. But they will, in the course of time, they will have greater, more number of places from where they can do more operations and project, uh, project uh, greater power. My uh, third uh, observation would be about uh, about India's India's own interests in the in in the South China Sea. I think there is there are three reasons why the Indians have got interested in 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 the South China Sea. Uh, one of them is that India's trade uh, uh, trade uh, that passes through the South China Sea has been growing uh, quite substantially. Uh, nearly about 55 to 60 percent of our trade these days flows through the, through the Malacca Straits. And because we have economic economic interests in that part of the world, it is only fair for India. To, uh, to also have some maritime presence in that region. Uh, the second uh, uh, point that, uh, that um, Indians often point out is that India has now become an important player in the international system. And it wants to be seen to be taking a position on, on matters of, uh, of, of regional interest and governance. So the South China Sea, for instance, the arbitration that happened between Philippines and, and China was something on which India couldn't have sat on the fence. So as opposed to say 10 years earlier, when maybe Indians won't have made a statement about this, it is important for India to make a statement to show where it stands on these issues, which is why we came up with the with the uh, vision document with the US. And I, I agree with Pramit when he says that the Modi was, 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 was the driving force behind this because he wanted to give the impression that, that, that we weren't ambivalent about what was happening in the in the South China Sea. So the second reason why India must, India has been taking a lot of interest in the, uh, in that part of the world is because uh, maritime governance has emerged as a, uh, as an area of contestation. And on this front, India must be seen to be playing a leading, uh, a leading role. Thirdly, and most importantly, I think there is always the balance of power argument. The Indians realize fully well that if China can consolidate its hold over the South China Sea, then it can project power more effectively into the Indian Ocean region. In fact, then the Chinese uh, uh, foray into the Indian Ocean region strategically is almost a given certainty. It's inevitable that the Chinese will come in and they will come in in a way that they will, they will have more number of places where they can set up permanent or a sustained presence. So for India, it's important to make sure that if there is an issue with the South China Sea, it, it's pointed out and that these anxieties that, that China faces, I mean, in a, in a geopolitical context, uh, continue to continue to play on, and that's, so that's the third reason uh, that uh, that India is taking so much interest in the in the Western Pacific and the, and the South China Sea. What are the salient, salient aspects of India's uh, Indian Ocean strategy? I have to tell you that there's two things that are common about India's Indian Ocean strategy and the South China's uh, and the Chinese white paper. I can't say so much about Chinese maritime strategy because officially China does not have a maritime strategy. Uh, Professor Yuji made a very compelling presentation in the morning, but that's extrapolation from what, what, you, what you think China is trying to do with, 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 with its tuition strategy. Officially, the Chinese white paper simply says this. It says that we're going to move in from active defense, a, a, a policy of active defense, to open seas protection. Now, many analysts within India uh, thought this to be a sign that the Chinese are not going to come into the Indian Ocean because it's open seas protection. But well, the Chinese would clarify to you, as, as, as they did in some of our interactions with them, to say that this simply means that we are going to move from a literal coastal uh, approach to an approach that covers the entire first island chain and maybe even beyond. But it has nothing to do with the, 
uh, with the Indian Ocean region. So the South, so the Chinese uh, uh, white paper actually does not talk about the Indian Ocean at all. The, the word Indian Ocean does not appear appear there. Similarly, the uh, Navy's, uh, Indian Navy's uh, new maritime strategy that was released last year does not talk about the South China Sea in a way that it is an area of interest. It just says it's an area of secondary interest and were there to be a contingency, India would be there. But it goes out of its way to play down the the tension that India has with, with China. So the strategy officially does not say very much anything about confronting China in the maritime commons. However, I have to say this, if you look at political statements that have come out and speeches made by some dignitaries, senior, senior, senior people, it becomes clear that there, there definitely is, is, is a plan for, for the Indian Ocean and there is a plan for the South China Sea. For instance, if you look at um, um, uh, Foreign Secretary Jay, Jay Shankar's speech very recently at the Indian Ocean Conference in Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very smart speech in which he made some clear references to what India's policy is going to be with regard to the oceans. Uh, Jay Shankar makes it very clear that uh, in India treats the Indian Ocean region as a coherent and integrated space, as he calls it. He says that this is a space that has a character, it has a particular personality to it. And the allusion is that uh, the, 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 is that India is is a key player, is a key enabler, and it will always play play a central role in the in the in the security of this region. He also mentions the neighborhood first policy, and he says that uh, India will do what it takes to build the capacities of its uh, of its neighbors, uh, not just land neighbors, but even sea neighbors. And this is exactly what has happened in real terms. If you look at the uh, the 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 maritime developments only in the past six months or maybe about an year, it becomes very clear that there is a plan. Uh, so India has been setting up maritime infrastructure uh, in, in Seychelles, in, in, in Sri Lanka, Maldives, other places, uh, uh, radar chains, uh, automatic identification stations, other maritime infrastructure, uh, doing a lot of capacity building. Uh, Barracuda is a big, uh, fr nearly a frigate-sized ship uh, that India has presented to the uh, uh, to Mauritius. We've given... Um, um, that is uh, aircrafts, um, pat patrol aircrafts to these small small island states. So there's there's a lot happening. Plus, India has also been strengthening the uh, the uh, infrastructure at the Andaman Islands. So the Andaman Islands are being prepared as nearly a st like a strategic garrison. You know, there's there's now uh, stealth frigates that are deployed to the uh, to uh, the Andamans. There, there's a whole whole uh, chain of uh, uh, radar stations that's been uh, that's been set up. It's, it now has an airfield, uh, and, and and there's many other things that India is doing to showcase its presence in the within the uh, South Asian uh, South Ocean, Asian littorals, and that is an example, I think, of the uh, of the neighborhood uh, first policy. Um, uh, thirdly, and most importantly, I think. Uh, uh, Modi has identified that maritime is not just about navies and contests, it's also about development. So there's this whole new focus now on, uh, on, on blue, blue economy projects, uh, developmental projects. So, uh, you know, the fisheries, uh, aqua, um, uh, marine sciences, uh, and, and, and the Modi government uh, is, is trying to make sure that it can it can take up some projects with these smaller nations that can develop greater employment for their people. So there is also a whole, a whole uh, developmental tenor to the discussion that is now being developed. And that again placed into Indian interest because that means that India then becomes an indispensable partner for this, uh, uh, for the region. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say one other thing about, um, about, uh, uh, the, the the politics of the uh, one bolt uh, one belt one road because finally all the discussions uh, come back to the one belt uh, one road. Uh, recently, there was a Chinese uh, uh, captain of a ship uh, that said uh, that as long as China has a, a Chinese company in a particular location that can be used as a it is a forward forward point for the navy. Now this. Uh, comment was picked up in India and discussed in maritime circles, what did it mean? And it essentially meant that, uh, for, for Indians, uh, it meant that the Chinese model of expanding their power in the Indian Ocean region does not just have a maritime component, it also has a very strong commercial component to it. So the Chinese, uh, the, the plan is to invest heavily in the maritime sector, get your companies there, base there, get them to develop islands, 
uh, give islands or, or, or locations, build infrastructure there, and then take over that inf infrastructure. Uh, which is why, as it was stated in the morning, when the Chinese sent their uh, submarine uh, in 2014 in, in October to, the, to Sri Lanka, it burst at a location that was controlled by a Chinese company. Um, now, these are little Chinese enclaves within the, within the Indian Ocean region, which, uh, which China, in a manner of speaking, uh, controls or owns. And even though they are the sovereign territory of another nation, these are little places from where uh, China can uh, can uh, project its uh, its its maritime power. So uh, this is the uh, th this is an, uh, a component of of Chinese maritime strategy that that cannot be uh, cannot be ignored. Uh, the second uh, instance that was very uh, very interesting is that uh, the Chinese State uh, Oceanic Administration came out came out with a full length feature article on the maritime Silk Route recently, which stated that the these projects uh, essentially were meant to uh, break out of the U.S. imposed three island chain. The, the, the maritime Silk Route. It said it, it, it was meant to exert Chinese maritime power and project China's maritime rights and interests. Um, and there was no talk of any win-win cooperation when it came to the MSR. So this was another, another sign to the Indians that uh, this was really, that there, there seemed to be a maritime component to the, uh, uh, to the, to the Chinese uh, deployments in the region. My last point is this. Uh, um, regardless of what China and India do in their in their uh, respective domains. It's very clear that that the politics of this is going to remain heavy, heavily heavily contested. Uh, for instance, uh, it was pointed out uh, just just some time back that uh, uh, that the Chinese had initiated a dialogue with India to get India to participate in some non-traditional. Uh, issues within the Indian Ocean region. This, this was a dialogue that was held in February last year. But apparently there was an unwillingness from the Indian side to move ahead on, our, on these proposals because there was no clarity to what the Chinese were suggesting. It almost seemed as if uh, the, the Chinese were, were, were creating an excuse for sending in their maritime forces to do some exercises with the Indians because that, that would in some ways legitimize China's presence in the Indian Ocean region. Now the Chinese will obviously uh, deny this, uh, but that that was a very clear sense that uh, that India got. Second, uh, most importantly, when the Chinese talk about uh, being a maritime power, uh, it's very interesting that uh, they have a concept of of strategic management of the oceans. They don't mean maritime power in the sense of a naval power, but in the sense of a power that can dominate the regions region in, in complete terms, in comprehensive terms. So uh, developing the oceans, exploiting the oceans, controlling them, making the rules there. And, uh, and even if, if, the, if the Chinese didn't have their navy in, the re in that region, they will want to play a strong part in the governance of the Indian Ocean region. So even uh, if India did not pay so much attention to the maritime uh, or, the, or the naval side of the strategy, the governance side of the strategy is going to have an effect on the way India, uh, India makes its own counter strategy to, to, India, uh, to Chinese forays in the, within the region. I think I'll stop here and I'll, I'll take more, uh, some more points during the question and answer session. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Abhijit. I'll, uh, when we get to the Q&A, I'd like to I'll foreshadow my question to you. Do you think that China has a legitimate, uh, uh, or there could be a legitimate naval presence, Chinese naval presence in the Indian Ocean? And do you think that China could play a legitimate role in Indian Ocean governance? Um, Dashana. So uh, Dashana Barua will uh, now talk about maritime domain awareness. It's a question or it's an issue that we're going to be hearing an awful lot more of in coming years. Thank you, David. Um, last speaker in the last session, day-long conference, no pressures at all. Uh, I'm, I'll be talking about maritime domain awareness as a critical outcome of India's evolving uh, naval strategy. Uh, the context has already been placed through the day why we need to have better maritime domain awareness. Um, 
I'm just going to say MDA from here on, which is Maritime Domain Awareness. Um, in the Indian Ocean is an evolving policy, and it's a work in progress um, in terms of revising what already exists. The most recent event that changed um, India's policy on MDA was the uh, Mumbai attacks in 2008, which exposed India's vulner vulnerabilities in its surveillance and protection of its coastal waters. Um, terrorists from uh, Pakistan sailed up to the coast of Mumbai and opened fire on uh, public places. Um, it was a harrowing and a very embarrassing incident um, for the Indian government and the Indian Navy. Until then, the um, mechanisms in place for coastal security were enough for the security environment that was in the Indian Ocean. But it, but it is changing, and it is changing uh, not just in our coastal waters, but in the larger Indian Ocean. After 2611, the Indian Navy took a lead in establishing um, a number of measures in beefing up its um, capabilities um, in its coastal surveillance uh, uh, structure. Without going into details, India installed a chain of um, identification system receivers um, and coastal radars along the mainland and, its, and, its, and the islands. It's also set up an information management and analysis center and the National Command Control Communication and Intelligence Network. This network collates data on um, all vessels operating near the Indian coast from multiple technical sources. In short, India today has um, a strong surveillance system for its coastal waters, including better coordination between the Indian Navy, coast, uh, its Coast Guard, um, Indian Navy, Coast Guard, Marine Police, and different agents of the state, state and the central government. There are some gaps that are being address, addressed in the second phase of the MDA integration, but New Delhi today has much better eyes and all, on all activities in its coastal waters than ever before. Uh, 2026-11 in some sense reflects India's confidence in the Indian Ocean strategy because um, New Delhi did not anticipate any intrusions in, the, in its maritime domain. Uh, it, it was like a big jolt to the to the to to India and the Indian and India's maritime policies, um, because um, a strong secure strong security of its coastal waters should have been a natural and a first po first policy in place for a dominant power in the Indian Ocean. Uh, it took a tragic incident to wake up to wake India up to its changing maritime security domain, which has now set the ball roll rolling. Having secured its coastal waters, now India is looking to expand that awareness beyond its coastal waters and across the Indian Ocean. The Indian Navy so far has um, worked by itself on this issue, but the need to work together with actors in the region is constantly growing. We've heard through the day about India's advantages in the Indian Ocean, uh, which allows New Delhi the space to play a dominant role. But in order to maintain that advantage, um, the Indian Navy needs to be aware of what's going on in the Indian Ocean, whether it's from a hostile nation or a friendly nation. Um, the maritime security strategy released last year, um, in fact, mentions um, MDA as a critical requirement for maritime security and an essential tool to deter adversaries and maintain a strategic advantage. Um, it is important to be aware of submarines present in, in these waters. Scouting for submarines in open sea is a very difficult task. And in terms of better eyes and ears in the, in the Indian Ocean, a common narrative is India's better access over the Malacca Strait Straits and the Nicobar Islands. But it's not the submarine, submarines transiting through um, the Malacca Straits that India is worried about because the Malacca Straits are shallow enough for the submarines to be monitored and follow where they're going. The problem is when these submarines enter the Indian Ocean through other entry points, such as the Lombok and Ombai Straits, and follow where it's going. Where it's going. Uh, the problem also comes when India does not see a Chinese submarine in its waters, and a few days later, there is a submarine in the Karachi port. Um, now, it's difficult for any one Navy to monitor the Indian Ocean region because it's a vast area. Uh, countries who have a better MDA in, in the Indian Ocean, such as the Americans, are working with partners on surveillance in the Indian Ocean. The entire point of the MDA is for the Indian Navy to be aware of the developments in its area of uh, primary interest and adapt, develop, and manage the situation rather than wake up in shock one day to the changes that have occurred. And, and this requires friends and partners. <coughs> India obviously is realizing these developments as making an effort to work together with friendly navies in the region, but India is still more comfortable um, working with the smaller island nations in the region than bigger uh, nations. Uh, We've heard uh, about India's engagement with island nations such as Maldives, Seychelles, Mauritius, and Sri Lanka. And India's put in a place, uh, 
put in place a series of coastal radar networks, um, linking it with India's own MDA network. India is also helping uh, helping build coastal protection capabilities for these islands. It deployed surveillance aircrafts in uh, Seychelles' um, exclusive economic zone as, as recently as March 2016 for the first time, and assigned a couple of agreements with Mauritius and um, uh, Seychelles to develop strategic infrastructure in an, eff in an effort to extend its surveillance reach in the Southwest Indian Ocean. Still, there are large gaps in India's ability to uh, monitor subsurface vessels in the Indian Ocean and through the Indian Ocean. Um, MDA is crucial for India to maintain its dominance in the Indian Ocean. Um, India has taken baby steps in establishing an MDA relationship with other neighbors in the region. Um, India signed a white shipping agreement with Singapore, Australia, US, and Vietnam, and looking, at, looking to sign uh, the same agreement with a number of other nations, including Japan. Um, Australia was actually the second nation that India signed the white shipping agreement with, but it's for purely commercial ships. There's nothing sensitive about the information that is being shared, or uh, that they want to share with no military angle. Uh, but this sets the base to develop the next stage for perhaps military information sharing. Um, None of the agreements are oper operationalized yet due to technical difficulties and a system is still being worked out how India can best exchange the information with the countries that it has signed the white sh shipping agreement with. But most important, importantly, this is a significant development in trust, trust building between India and the countries that it's, that it's looking to work with. Uh, there needs to be much more trust between India and its friends um, in the region to begin um, sharing information. Um, and, and this is a good place to start. Uh, there is a great deal of concern that India's information, that the information that India shares, will be shared with other parties, especially within the alliance system, and more importantly, possibly sharing it with Pakistan. Um, India needs much more convincing on this, and there is a great deal of concern in sharing information with other countries, dis despite a much warmer relationship with most of India's partners today. From a policy point of view, um, the MDA is not about containment. Um, it's accepting that China has perhaps gone to a league above itself and the strategic competition between China and US is going to widen. It's about securing its position and interest and working together with friends and partners India is comfortable with, who respects India's concerns and allow India the space to grow as um, India is beginning to come out of its isolation. The significant difference in the government, the current government, is the political will. Uh, whether it is to do something or even whether not to do anything, there is a clearer will than in the previous decade. So I think that's making a lot of difference. Um, China is a big neighbor and we have our problems, we have our concerns uh, regarding a strong China-Pakistan um, relationship. So I don't think so we can completely ignore China's sentiments in what we do. But perhaps um, we need to stop looking at India's policies and actions as a reaction to what China is doing or as a containment policy. Uh, because um, I don't think so. It really is a containment policy. It's uh, it's what it's about what we need to do to secure our to India's strategic interest and maintain its dominance or its role in South Asia in the Indian Ocean and as an aspiring global power. Um, this is a good time for India to start conversation because India is still in a position where it can negotiate its terms of engagement. Uh, nations are willing to listen to India, consider India's concerns. Uh, nations want to work with India, and. Um, India has its restrictions, uh, but we are at a favorable position to talk now, then come to a stage where we might need greater assistance. Um, we are in a favor of a multipolar security order um, in, across the Indo-Pacific, and most nations are in favor of India playing a strong security, uh, strong and a larger security role. This brings us to the question of capabilities and resources, whether we have it to play that role. On MDA, Indian Ocean is too big for any, no any nation, like I've mentioned before. So you have to work with partners. India has identified a few friends it can work with, but there are a lot of traditional thinking uh, that the military establishment in India needs to come out of. India may have an advantage in the Indian Ocean, but China is catching up faster than expected. New Delhi may be willing to work better with other nations, but China holds advantages elsewhere. Um, so despite a stronger will, India has to be very calculative in its maritime approach because of its threats along its continental uh, border. India's threats from its land border is more immediate and real than from, its, uh, than from the sea. At sea, for India, at this point, it's more about strategic advantage and power play. So given the troubles along our um, border with Pakistan and increasing stronger China-Pakistan relationship, India has to be calculative and prioritize its defense um, 
uh, uh, prioritize defense resources ba based on its budget and its priorities. Uh, within these limitations in the maritime domain, I think a feasible framework would be a division of labor um, over areas of common interest. Perhaps India needs to start talking about concepts such as shared responsibility and burden sharing. Um, these are all completely new areas and uh, um, there are going to be problems before India can reach any kind of a effective uh, and, and, and comfortable model. But we need to start this conversation and I think we are setting the stage just, to, just for that. Um, in terms of Sino-Indian competition and how India and China will engage um, with each other in the maritime domain, engagement with China in the maritime domain has been limited, but India's engagement with other nations have increased definitely. Um, as uh, Pramit Pal Chaudhary pointed out, India feels insulted that China does not take New Delhi seriously, and I agree that China does not consider India's concerns, um, but I think the competition from China's end was never with India, it was always with the United States. Um, my sense from interactions is that China will build ports, um, it will look to expand its presence, and uh, they put it through like it's a fact, it's a right, and it's going to happen. And uh, the tone is such, and uh, so Delhi can figure out what it wants to do. So it's not about containing China because India's got the, we've gone beyond that stage, it's about how does India manage its interest and secure it in the unfolding Sino-Indian strategic relationship. So instead of contain China strategy, India is perhaps investing its limited resources in building its um, relationship and strengthening its advantages as a response and seeing what works best. Uh, I see two immediate challenges in India's new maritime evolving policy within the MDA. Uh, one is a backlash from within uh, for all the new changes that the current government is trying to bring in. Uh, I think a good example is the Logistics Exchange Memorandum of Agreement, uh, probably known as LIMOA with US that uh, we just signed. Um, the government went through with it, but there was a lot of criticism from all uh, sections, from politicians to former defense minister to the strategic community, where people just could not understand why India would want to sign something like that with the United States. and uh, And you know, give away its, I guess, its own uh, freedom because the narrative from, from for, for people who opposed it was that um, if you get into such a closer relationship with the United States, then you're going to get dragged into their problems across the world. Um, it has taken a huge amount of push and political will to go through with it, but it has already made India conscious of perhaps moving too fast in building its relationship with nations still viewed with some suspicion. So logistic agreements with countries like Australia and Japan, even if it makes sense, or um, if, even if there is no strategic threat from it, is going to be slow and in the back burner. The other is our Ministry of Defense, which is still primarily focused on the northern borders and on our army. So priority as far as defense is concerned is going to be land-based threat. So despite, so regardless of a uh, stronger vision from the Indian Navy. Um, the developments are going to be slow and calculated. Even within the maritime policy, there's going to be a lot of priori prioritizing. And right now, um, I think it's a good thing that um, engaging in establishing maritime relationship with the Indian Ocean region uh, players is one of India's priorities, which is, uh, although it's at a diplomatic and a strategic level. Um, on a concluding note, I think we're beginning to see some changes in India's uh, MDA, and it certainly is evolving. China has definitely been a factor in this evolving policy, but it's more about a strategy for a changing security environment for India in its primary area of interest, rather than just a reaction to China's uh, increasing Chinese presence. It's a long way to go, but there are some mechanisms in place, and if India and this current government can keep up with its political will to take a call on the decisions that it takes, um, its approach and effort, keep up its approach, approach and effort, it definitely will head somewhere and possibly toward a favorable position in the Indian Ocean. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Dashana. Well, um, Abhijit, if I, could, yeah. if I could impose on you first just to have your thoughts about uh, really, in, in your view, is, is there a a legitimate pre Chinese presence in the Indian Ocean, and probably more importantly, do you see them as playing a legitimate role in Indian Ocean governance, and what would that be? Yeah, well, you know, th this is a, is a hard question for me to answer, but let me just say this. Uh, there was a term that was used in the morning to explain China's uh, uh, presence in the Indian Ocean. It was, it was said it is an, it's an exterior line power. Uh, this is something that maritime analysts often discuss. You have interior line powers and exterior line powers. 
which means either you're an indigenous state that has a geographical advantage in a particular, uh, you, have a, you have a flexibility for operations, or you come from the outside. So we are exter exterior line passed to the South China Sea, China is the ex exterior line part of the Indian Ocean region. When an exterior, China will be the first exterior line part, by the way, to, to be coming into a, into a new theater of operation. The US did it some time back. But the key is this, there has to be a degree of strategic reassurance for the, for the indigenous states. And the US did that quite effectively. Because the, uh, it's, it's not as if nations don't care about their, their uh, national interest. I think US cared greatly about its own national interest. But you have to create a narrative in which the smaller states or the weaker states within, within, a, within a theater feel reassured about, about your presence in the region. I think the issue with the India-China equation is that Indians have never got the sense that China is in the Indian Ocean region for reasons other than China's own resource interests. And uh, the reason the Indians are often pointing to the fact that there might be a larger strategic game plan in this is because the Chinese have done nothing whatsoever to convince us that they will be able to provide the public goods when they come into the Indian Ocean region. Which is why when we have a dialogue with them, and we often do, we just had dialogue with them in February, and we were the point I was mentioning, and we were trying to ask them that, do you have any concrete proposals of what you can do together? They had nothing really concrete to offer. And the sense you get is that that they simply want to legitimize their presence. They want to be a legitimate presence. But for doing that legitimate, for being legitimate, there's a quid pro quo. You've got to do something to reassure the other side. I think that reassures Until that thing does not happen, I think there's going to be some suspicion in the minds of the Indians about what's the, what's the big Chinese plan. I, we are very sure that the Chinese don't treat the Indian Ocean region as the South China Sea. It's not a core interest for them. This is intensely geopolitical. But it is very clear that they geopolitically want to dominate this, the space in order to be a, a legitimate presence. And once they do that, then India's strategic leverages in that region get attenuated to, to some extent. The India is not the, the net provider of security. India is not the big, uh, big naval power that all nations go to when there is a regional calamity or a crisis. That will be China. And that doesn't play very well. That doesn't sit very easily with, with, with Indian minds. And um, Dashana, just quickly, um, you described uh, India developing its broader maritime domain awareness system with a focus on the southwest Indian Ocean, the islands, and Andamans in the northeast. But there's major gaps, obviously. One is in the northwest Indian Ocean, yeah. Persian Gulf, etc. The other is through the other straits through the Indian Ocean. Do you think India could ever have a capability to build a system by their, their by itself? And if not, what shocks might be needed to actually move India to into partnerships? I think the shocks already come. I mean, you know, India is now looking for partnership. I think it's just going to be the pace of how quickly they go on to build these partnerships. I don't think so. India is looking, India is definitely looking to build up its capabilities by itself, but it also realizes that's going to take a while. It's going to take a long term, and then it's, there's, there are a lot of limitations and restrictions, be it resources from budget wise, priorities everywhere in different parts of in the defense. So, the sensible thing right now is to do to kind of what I said about working with other countries in the region. But again, building up which countries are we comfortable working with where we can get to a point where we can you know build that network of uh, domain awareness in, in the um, straits i think commander singh said about strengthening up andaman and nicobar Islands. so that's been one key area where india is now focusing more on it uh, building up even uh, you know uh, building up even the for trying to see something in the Bay of Bengal. And Japan is actually, the I think, the only country who's been allowed to invest in infrastructure building in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands and the and in Northeast India, where both foreign funding is kind of restricted. So India is finding its com like you know, countries where it can work with, not necessarily directly from a military point of view, but from where it can get some support. In the, it's also, it has a, uh, it's, it's got some sort of listening post in Oman. It's got, uh, there is, uh, there are some, places, mechanisms in place, but how 
I think India is looking to strengthen its generally its West Asia policy and like you know where it is going to build up something uh, and try and look. It hasn't happened as yet. We have focused right now. We are focused in an immediate neighborhood just outside our coastal waters, and you know so it's so we have covered kind of the island nations and Andamans, which is the first line that you know that once you beef them up, then you go. So I think the Middle East is going to come in next and surely. So but by itself, I don't think so. It can kind of. At this point, I don't think so. It can kind of build up something. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Nick Floyd from the Department of Defence. Uh, both both speakers, thank you very much for your for your remarks so far this afternoon. Both of you have indicated that there is a, I guess, a willingness and an intention to some extent of India to uh, to to reach out to a number of different Indian Ocean nations uh, in a in a fairly uh, benign but very uh, complementary and cooperative way. One nation that uh, that hasn't really been mentioned at, at this stage, and I, I realise it's a it's a great opportunity for uh, for Australian commentators to realise exactly how small we actually are in some other eyes. But what do you see would be some of the opportunities for an Australian Indian uh, relationship uh, to complement what you've been talking about? Uh, I think the India Australia relationship is uh, already doing quite well. You know, until just a few years ago, there was virtually very little contact between the Indian Navy and the Australian Navy. But just in the past uh, two or three years, I think there's been uh, a lot of movement forward. You know, we did the OS index uh, about a year ago, and uh, it's very uh, it's uh, it's worth worth noting that uh, a lot of exercises that were held during uh, that exercise. But exercises that we don't quite do with some of our closest partners, uh, ESW exercises, uh, interdiction. Uh, so that that jump uh, from you know just sort of benign a benign relationship to a relationship that's now looking at uh, uh, closer integrated operations has been very. So these are the kind of exercises that we do with uh, with the US uh, and Japan and. Uh, during the Malabar exercises, but yes, I mean, there's there's always scope for greater uh, greater expansion. I think there's uh, there must be uh, more uh, interaction at the service to service level. We should have some Australian officers visiting us. We should have there should be some cross postings, and that's the kind of thing that that develops greater bond homing, a greater interoperability. So I think, uh, and and I think uh, there's also a case for more frequent exercises. Uh, the, the kind of uh, thing that we have, say with the US, where we, you know, every couple of months we have something or the other that uh, may, maybe a US ship that comes down, we're doing, you know, some past six exercises and other things. So operationally, I think uh, it's a good start has been made by OP, uh, uh, OS Index, but we could take this further by, uh, by having, uh, uh, more uh, more frequent visits, uh, more frequent exercises. Um, yeah, I think I, I agree uh, that the India Australia relationship has been doing pretty well. But I think uh, a lot of it is also because there was just nothing before Modi's visit here. So there was so much ground to be covered that you know the fundamental steps were easy to do out. Like you know because there was space for cooperation, collaboration in a lot of areas. Now that has happened, so it'll be interesting to say how far it goes uh, and how quickly it goes. Um, but I think there's still a sense, both in India and Australia, that we are very far for each other. Uh, I think that notion still somewhere exists that you know how do we do we play in each other's strategic uh, um, strategic interest, I suppose, in one way. And uh, the other thing that I have noticed uh, from Australia point of view is that every time Australia, mostly when Australia looks at India in the current geopolitical context, it's looking at Australia through the lens of China in the sense that, okay, China is rising and this is what's happening, so what can India do to balance that rise? So the expectations are different, whereas India is looking at Australia as like, you know, just a bilateral relationship in the Indian Ocean and what can we do together? So I think there's a difference in expectations both from Australia and the Indian point of view. We need to build trust. There needs to be a lot more trust, and I think there are some mechanisms in place. But um, push is, I think, more from Australia at this point than from India. India is definitely responding, but I think it's going to be a bit slower than what Australia is expecting. Uh, this question or comment and question really extends beyond our current speakers. I think there may be others from uh, the, the the China experts and the uh, Indian experts who might want to respond. One of, the, one of the things that is not new but stands out again out of today's presentations is, is the issue of transparency or lack of transparency. Um, 
and it's been mentioned, the word's been mentioned a couple of times today already. Um, we've seen in recent times China producing defence white papers and the like. Now, yes, they're open to various interpretations, but at least it gives the community a sense of where they are trying to head. In India's case, we've seen some excellent, in, in, indeed, I think quite articulate maritime strategy documentation coming out, the Indian Navy's publication that was released early this year, I think is an excellent piece of work, and also the updated doctrinal work. Um, however, we, we still don't see anything like white papers or so on coming out of India. So, and, and, and to an extent, this applies to China. So it means that, you know, for today's discussion about the India-China relationship, and for the rest of us who are affected by that, one way or the other, it leaves us all guessing and, and second guessing. Um, I heard um, the former assistant national security advisor in India respond to my question at IDSA in 2000, uh, 2014 as to why India doesn't produce defence white papers and the like. And his response was, well, we want to maintain our strategic flexibility. We don't want to be held to account, which I thought was interesting. But um, when, when are we likely to see a change, or are we likely to see a change in this, um, particularly at a time when um, both these emerging powers are exerting more or seeking, seeking to exert greater influence in and around the region? I mean, we're reliant at the moment on various policy and pronouncements and speeches for you know, um, you know, the look east moving to act east policy, that sort of thing. But overall, it's very hard to understand exactly where India is trying to head and to a lesser extent, although I think it's clearer, where China's trying to head. Thank you. So uh, you, you mentioned a point that actually goes to the heart of a uh, problem that the services have been facing in India with regard to uh, national defense policies that we don't have a national de defense doctrine, we don't have any integrated guidance on the matter. Now, th this, is, this is an issue that we, we need an entire conference to sort of discuss this issue. <laughs> we've, we've debated this, uh, you know, for, uh, for, for hours and, and days at end in the IDSA. I mean, you were there with us when we were there. Uh, but, uh, but let me just say this. The issue with, with, with Indian uh, foreign, uh, with Indian military uh, policy uh, thinking is that uh, a lot of analysts feel that ambivalence is by itself uh, a, a tool and that it, it should, be, should be exploited to your advantage. And that when you're very clear about, a, uh, we take a very clear stand on an issue, you in some ways uh, reduce your own space for maneuver. Uh, it, it, this, it's, a, it's a very popular that thought. Was Prakash it was, it, that was Prakash Menon's answer also. And, and it's not just him, I've heard many uh, admirals, including Arun Prakash at one point, tell me that how do you know that strategic ambivalence is not a, uh, is, is not a strategy by itself? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, these are, these are questions that we have raised with our own senior people, but, but, the, uh, but, but the problem is not with the military as much as it, it is with the, with the political class, that they're really unwilling to, uh, to, to, to take a call on uh, what exactly are the issues that need to be flagged and what positions need to be taken. As a result of which, what happens is that there is a bit of ad hocism in the way we uh, structure our, uh, our responses to, to certain challenges. Uh, but, uh, but, but that's just the way that uh, Indian mm, uh, strategic culture is. And I think, uh, I think we, we will just have to. <laughs> <laughs> we will just have to kind of live with it. But, 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 but having said that, I have to say that, that a lot of uh, uh, forward movement has been made in the past two or three years. For example, if you look at the Indian Navy's own strategy that came out, it took certain positions on issues that would actually uh, that would have otherwise been highlighted in a, in a, in a white paper. Uh, especially with regard to the neighborhood, the how, how, what, what the Indian Navy is going to do in terms of operations within the neighborhood and uh, what sort of capacity building will it do. This, these are all things that would have come. But you're talking about the South China Sea. You're talking about the Western Pacific and what exactly is the white paper about that. That is an area that the Navy does not have the mandate to go into until it doesn't get a very clear direction from the political class. And that sadly hasn't happened so far. But I suspect it might stay like this for a few more years. Shana, do you want to say anything about it? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Kamal Singh is pretty much uh, wrapped about, like, I've heard the same thing, like, how do you know, how do you know that you know, strategic ambivalence is not a 
tool in itself. But uh, I think on white paper overall defense strategy, there has been some attempts in like writing a few. I think uh, third part already mentioned that there were, and uh, I've I've also uh, known that there has been some attempts, but it's never um, I've never seen them really being released or like I know that they've been written and there are people who have worked on it, but there's I've never seen anything come out of it. So I don't know if it's like a MEA or MOD thing that you know that they can't agree on things and it never goes forward okay. from it and you know maybe mm. those points that are because actually it's some things that if you leave it just to the Navy I think it would be much more stronger stand and uh, maybe a bolder uh, approach like uh, even for Malabar the Navy was uh, happy to call it a trilateral much before it got a go ahead for it uh, and, uh, and in the end it says like permanent representative. Japan's permanent representative at the Malabar and bilateral exercise with the United States. Uh, and at the same point for the, you know, like if you ask the Indian Navy about what is the problem with doing a joint exercise with Australia, Japan and US and the answer would be like, you know, we do individual with them anyway. So from a technical point of view, it saves resources and time if we bring them together. But try getting that through MOD or MEA. I mean, it's, it's never going to work. And if I just add to that, the other problem is that we are not truly integrated, sir. Uh, because of that, what happens is the Navy is a forward-leaning service. It, it, it almost considers itself to be a foreign policy, uh, an instrument of foreign policy. You know, it does benign operations, it does, you know, diplomatic, it considers itself to have a diplomatic role. The Army and the Air Force don't see themselves in, uh, in that light at all. And so while the Navy might be agreed to do a lot in the Pacific, I, will, I, I can't say the same thing for the Army or the Air Force. And because there is a disconnect in between the way the three services think, I mean, I know this is a bit like washing linen and in public, but that's just the way it is uh, with the uh, with the services that uh, that they don't agree on certain issues, and uh, in the absence of that agreement, it's very hard to come out with a national security uh, strategy. Some of you would be aware that uh, uh, we have this Friday um, a uh, uh, the next round of our Australia India Maritime Dialogue, which is part of this new suite. I think Darshan was mentioning as a new suite of sort of such dialogues that. Uh, have produced things like, you know, the white shipping agreement. Um, for me, having worked on India on and off for quite a few years, you can really tell the difference between uh, an initiative uh, or a dialogue or a piece of bilateral architecture that does engage India's interests and those that don't engage India's, India's interests. And, and this one quite clearly does. Um, and there's been follow-up on both sides, there's engagement, there are decent delegations, they happen on time, um, they produce work lists um, and they review work lists and see what's been done and what hasn't been done. Um, so as you say, I think it's, you know, slowly, slowly, but the, the pace um, uh, 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 and, and the scope of our interaction, both uh, sort of military, mil military, defence to defence, and in terms of strategic conversations about Indian Ocean matters and otherwise, has, is, is remarkably more healthy now than it was um, uh, just a few years ago. Uh, it, has some, it has a long way to go, but it has some real substance to it. It's probably because the defence attaché at the Indian High Commission is, uh, is a Navy fellow, so he knows the importance of uh, <laughs> strategic engagement. Might I just say this, ma'am, that, you know, uh, we often talk interoperability and how navies should come together and work together, you know, learn each other's codes and procedures. I think the interoperability, even before you begin to begin to come together as services and do things together, we should be able to come together as people and, and, and do things together. I remember I was part of a uh, India-US uh, dialogue when I was, when, uh, I was in service. And uh, what I found very interesting is that that discussion that we had with our American counterparts, was uh, very, very uh, creative and imaginative. So uh, there were questions like, are we getting ready for a world of unfamiliar challenges where you might have uh, state actors uh, involved with non-state actors? Where, and you know, that was a time when there was a, if you remember just about three, four years ago, there was a Pakistani warship that was very nearly hijacked by the Al-Qaeda. Mm. And uh, uh, it, was, it was just some last minute security forces, you know, they just came in and they sort of foiled the attempt. But if that would have happened, that ship would have been commandeered by a bunch of, you know, radicalized, uh, and they were they were serving naval officers, some young left, left, sub lieutenants and lieutenants, and these these ships would have launched attacks on on Indian ships and American ships, and this was held right in the aftermath of that, and we were discussing about how there are these open, ungoverned spaces wherein the non-state actor is increasingly empowered, 
and the non-state actor also has the backing of the state actor. So we were we were thinking of a scenario in which maybe the Pakistani some elements of the Pakistan government had maybe supported these these gentlemen that had that that had nearly taken over the ship. So uh, are we getting ready for 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 a, for a scenario where we might might have some such thing? And at that point, I remember maritime militias, for example, is something that now comes up for discussion very often with the, in the context of China. That was the time when the Americans had first told told us that you have got to get ready for a world because wherein you will face militias. We are we are facing militias in in uh, in, in the Persian Gulf. And, and our allies in Southeast Asia are facing these militias uh, that, are, that are Chinese. But are you getting ready to face Pakistani militias? The point I'm trying to make is this, that that interoperability uh, didn't need to reflect itself in operations at sea, even though that's where it should operate. Even in our dialogue, in our interactions, it was very clear that there was, that there was a meeting of minds and that they could preempt uh, the threats that we, could, that we could face in the future and that we could tell them some things about their... There was a genuine concern for them. So you answer your question. That genuine warmth sometimes I don't see in the India-China relationship. I suspect that warmth is there in the India-Australia uh, relationship too because it's easy for us to talk to the Australians. I've never been in a dialogue with the Australians. But I hear from what Darshana tells me, she's organized a few for the ORF, that it's uh, that uh, the, the dialogue's pretty frank. And I think, ma'am, you make an excellent point that if we continue talking to each other and just knowing each other, I think the relationship is going to get stronger and that will reflect on our interactions at sea. Okay, with those uplifting words, thank you very much, Abhishek. I'd like to, uh, I'll, I'll finish up here and I'd like to give um, a, a huge um, thanks to all of our speakers, some of who have come from uh, a long distance, Professor Yuji and, and Pramit Pal Chaudhuri, who, who um, spent most of yesterday sitting in beautiful Melbourne airport, uh, where his bags probably still are, and, uh, and Abhijit Singh and Dashana Barua and uh, uh, JD Yuan um, and Jian Zhang, who unfortunately had to go. So I, again, I thank you very, very much uh, for uh, your contributions. I think it's been an incredibly interesting uh, discussion covering all manner of, uh, of issues and I certainly come away with a lot of different ideas and I hope we can certainly continue this discussion about the, uh, the India-China relation and uh, it, its impact on, on Australia, which is only going to increase. So thank you very much.